everything what is nice and fastly welcome everybody to the last plenary session of this EAS meeting and don't slow down because we have still exciting talks in front of us. The first speaker will be Francois Poget and the title of his talk is Old Questions and New Enigma on the Planet Mars. Welcome. Hi, thank you very much. So I will uh, start my talk, share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? It's coming, yes. Thank you very much. So, um, so indeed, I will give a kind of a review talk about planet Mars. Of course, I could take hours to talk about this word, but I will focus on a few uh, old questions that have been changing and new enigmas. Uh, first, let's go to um, oh, first point is to say that uh, Mars is not a, a, a word that we are just discovering. Of course, there have been a lot of mission to Mars right now uh, operating. You have no less than eight uh, orbiter operating around Mars and uh, studying Mars and making maps and analyzing everything. You have three rovers uh, working and one lander in sight. And all these are uh, really uh, learning, teaching us a lot about the planet Mars, but also raising a lot of questions and enigma. Uh, the next steps will be a lot about Europe because uh, there will be uh, one year from now, uh, ExoMars, uh, the ExoMars rover, Rosin Flanken, will be launched. And then we're planning to do a big Mars sample return mission that will return the sample uh, selected by Perseverance, you all know about, and Europe will be, ESA will be very much involved in this project. So what have we learned? Well, back to basics, you all know, I'm sure that Mars is a small planet, um, about half the size of the Earth, uh, with a thin atmosphere, mostly made of CO2, it's just near the Earth, like on this map, it's 1.5 times further away from the sun than the, than the Earth. But, to summarize, uh, Mars is a small, desertic planet, very much like Earth. And one of the reasons why it's very much like Earth, because the obliquity, uh, which regulates the seasonal cycle, is almost the same. Uh, the rotation rate is almost the same as well. Uh, the length of the day is 24 hours and 40 minutes. And uh, because of that, many aspects of Mars are similar to, to a desert, small desertic Earth, like you have a, a, a trade winds, uh, monsoon jets, uh, low pressure system, uh, jet stream with regard to the atmosphere, you have volcanoes, you have lots of things. So I'm sure all you know that, you all know that. And the goal of my talk will be to update you, uh, astrophysicists uh, <laughs> that may know already a lot about Mars, but maybe just to bring you some uh, uh, recent stuff uh, so that you can reply to the public and maybe your students and maybe uh, learn something today. So if I go into more details, Mars is a little more complex than just the desertic Earth because you have lots of uh, activity. Uh, for instance, regarding the climate, you have a, a dust cycle, very active, very complex CO2 ice cycle with the atmosphere freezing. You have a water cycle, which is quite complex as well. And this is uh, raising a lot of enigma and questions I won't have time to discuss today. And instead, I will focus on one aspect that I think is a, a most in, most interest to the public and uh, and maybe your students, which is about water. Of course, water on Mars is always the uh, very important subject. Um, so, of course, as you probably know, you have a lot of water on Mars. Water, ice in the ice cap, in the subsurface. You have frost, like you can see here, uh, observed by Viking Two in the seventies. But of course, the big question is always, can we have liquid water? Because of a question re re related to habitability. And the answer very quickly is no. Uh, of course, you can have temperature and pressure above the triple point. In theory, you could have liquid water, but you can demonstrate that this water, uh, if, you, if you put some ice in the morning, it will never uh, melt because the latent heat is such that it will, won't be able to go above zero degrees Celsius in practice, unlike a rock. Moreover, uh, the, the pressure is such that you will need a 100% water vapor atmosphere to have some liquid water and it will evaporate super quickly. So no water. There have been lots of speculation about brines. In other words, uh, salty water, very salty. 
uh, at the surface of Mars, you can see uh, abundant literature on this subject. Uh, in particular, the salts could be uh, related to perchlorate that we have discovered in the, in the surface. And one of the reasons Brines has been uh, addressed uh, a lot is because of a phenomenon named the recurring slope linear that you may have heard of, which are the things that form seasonally on, on the slopes in the equator. And you can see this dark stuff. On the Earth, we have similar stuff, and they are related to liquid water usually. In Antarctica, for instance, you see something almost identical. And the peak of this, uh, this was discovered about 10 years ago, and the peak of this speculation about water and the rigorous slope linear was reached in September 2015. At the time, NASA announced a press conference related to water, and pe people became crazy about that. Uh, suddenly it was all about liquid water, there could be liquid water, there could be live, there could be frogs on Mars, everyone was excited, but it was crazy. In fact, it was all related to interesting work by Lejeune Audra and the, and the Cam IRAS camera team. And they, uh, they had found evidence for brines, hydrated salts in the recurring slope linear. No, we understand that this spectral evidence of brine were actually wrong. Uh, the, the evidence are not uh, really uh, robust. They have been uh, dismissed. And nowadays, it's we all agree that the recurring slope linear, even if they are spectacular, they are likely dry uh, aeolian processes not related to water. Another example of stories about liquid water and present day Mars as, is a phenomenon that you may know, which is are the gullies. You can see here example of gullies. These are quite spectacular debris flows that with meanders, levees, and lots of uh, characteristics that really uh, make them to look like a debris flow on the Earth, which are due to liquid water on the Earth. Uh, you can see them, they're not that small. They can be several kilometers long. And for some time, uh, people have been speculated about aquifer under pressure with releasing water, lots of crazy story. They could, people also imagine, I'm among them, that they could be related to seasonal melting of recent uh, melting of ice in the recent past, uh, historical past. But in the end, this does not hold. We have discovered since then that gullies currently form on present day Mars. You can see an example here between 2010 and 2013, a new branch of this gully formed. And we realized that these are formed in presence not of water, but of CO2 ice when the temperature is 150 K. And nowadays we are almost sure that they are formed by subliming CO2 ice through a very exotic process. Uh, we, with my colleague uh, Cédric Pilanger, we suggested the process uh, which could be a glass fluidized debris flow related to CO2 ice. Typically, at the end of winter, you have CO2 ice on the, surf, on the slopes where you, the gullies are observed. The solar flux hit the CO2 ice. It cannot melt. It only sublimes, so it pressurizes the, the, the grains, the porous uh, gra ground which is below. And then when the pressure is too high, it breaks and the, the, you have lots of outgassing and that destabilizes the slope and creates something that looks like a debris flow uh, related to water. We have example on the Earth. We have a fluidized dense pyroclistic flow on the Earth and they are quite spectacular and we think we have the same thing on Mars. So no liquid water there either. So we've been also looking for liquid water in the subsurface because if you have ice on the surface with the geothermal heat inside, we expect to to have melted ice in the interior uh, be, be below a few kilometers in the subsurface. And for that, uh, we have been using the radar Marsis, which is an inborn Mars Express, uh, which it's been operating since 2005. That's very large antenna. Uh, it's almost a 40 meters like antenna. And uh, for years, it was impossible to find anything. It seems that in fact, this method is not uh, sufficient uh, to really reach the depth where we, we could expect to have an aquifer. I could add, mention the fact that recently uh, some water melted something was discovered at the bottom of the what we call the southern polar layer deposits, a big glacier of water ice that we have uh, around the South Pole. And uh, there have been some uh, discovery of something that looks like uh, reflection that could be related to liquid water. 
the problem is that when we compute the estimated temperature there, it's well below zero degrees Celsius. That's why people talk about a brine uh, there again. And it's a little speculative, but it's quite exciting. If there is a liquidness subsurface, uh, it is exciting to um, wonder what could be the activity related to this uh, subsurface uh, water, either here or either deeper, not reachable by the radar at other latitude. And if there are um, subsurface liquid water, you can always speculate that a kind of life could, could have started there uh, or moved there. And there could be also some uh, geochemical activity uh, doing interesting stuff. And to um, it will be nice to drill there and get some uh, uh, sample from there, but it's super complex. It's several kilometers deep. Instead, we have been using another method, which is sniffing, <laughs> sniffing with possible trace gases that could be uh, uh, the gas from this uh, deep aquifer to see what kind of activity could be there. So this method has been uh, the, used for various things. And in particular, you may have heard about the presence of methane on Mars. Methane should not be present on Mars because the lifetime is only a few hundred of years long. There is no, there should not be a real source as far as we can tell. So finding methane is exciting. It means that there is maybe geochemical source that we do not understand or even better biological source. People have been quite excited about that. So methane was discovered in the uh, year 2000, 2004. Muma et al. with a very nice telescopic observation reported in 2009, observations in 2003. And um, people were, uh, this was quite debated until uh, Curiosity brought a tunable laser spectrometer instrument that was able to detect methane quite well. And uh, Chris Webster, the PI, reported uh, the discovery of methane. And this methane was quite uh, weird. It, you had a, a kind of seasonal cycle of not much methane, but sufficiently to be exciting at a fraction of a part per billion in the atmosphere. And sometime you had a burst of methane up to several, 10, even more part per billion. And that's a lot, in fact, that's a lot. It's not, it's unexpected, but it's completely mysterious. In fact, I can uh, tell you the story about when all this methane debate uh, was uh, going on. With my colleague, Franck Lefebvre, we were able to publish a paper in Nature without any scientific results, just demonstrating that the observed variation of methane on Mars are unexplained by known atmospheric chemistry and physics. It's a complete mystery. The, to have variation of methane, you have a, a, a process that destroys methane quicker than we expect, which is mysterious, and we need a source which is completely mysterious. So that's quite exciting. And we thought that we will have the final answer with the trace gas orbiter, which was designed to, as you can tell from the word, uh, monitor trace gases such as methane. And so it's part of the ExoMars 2016 mission. It carries six spectrometer and two of them are uh, able to really monitor uh, trace gas like methane with the exquisite accuracy because it's used the method of solar occultation, looking at the sun through the atmosphere and you have a very high signal to noise, a very high sensitivity. What was found? Well, nothing. No methane is detected at all. With the upper uh, value, uh, maximum value, uh, upper limit, which is 50 times lower than the Mars Science Laboratory, the Curiosity estimation. I won't have time to detail these figures, but uh, clearly it's a mysterious. So now we are facing the problem to reconcile the trace gas orbiter upper limit with the Curiosity uh, observations. And it's mystery, there is no viable solutions because it's hard to conceive how the trace gas orbiter data could be wrong because it's two instrument, two independent team, super sensitive. The tunable laser uh, on Curiosity team is also very good, not naive. They're looking for problems. They cannot understand why, why they measure methane. So there must be, it's, it, there must be a, uh, a reason, something explaining this, this discrepancy, and there is no easy solution. For instance, we could imagine a process that allow methane to be present just around curiosity, but not elsewhere, and that's mystery. So that's the debate now. If I had to bet something, I think there is no methane on Mars, but uh, it's not easy to understand. Okay, quickly I move on to other stories. 
Um, what I want to tell you is very quickly is, of course, the present day Mars uh, planet is very interesting, very active, lots of mysteries. But in addition, when we explore Mars, we explore several planets. We know that Mars has varies a lot in the past, in the past, uh, let's say, billion years. We know that it has gone through a lot of changes and in particular, due to change with the same atmosphere, with the same climate system, just because of the variation of its um, obliquity and orbital parameters. As you know, the Earth uh, has been obliquity, for instance, has not varied much in the past, between one plus or minus 1.4 degrees. And yet, this has been sufficient to uh, bring a lot of uh, climate change with ice ages, for instance. On Mars, we know that the obliquity varies a lot. Uh, in the past 10 million years, the billion million years, you can see here a variation between 15 degrees and more than 45 degrees. Before that, it's not sure because it's chaotic if we want to go before that. Uh, it went up above 60 degrees, and that certainly created a lot of climate change. We're trying to understand based on the geological records and climate modeling. And it's a, it's a very exciting uh, topic. And in fact, I'm working on an ERC project named Mars Through Time to understand what happened when you had the glaciation. Also, we know that at low obliquity, certainly the atmosphere, it's very CO2 uh, condensed, the atmosphere collapsed, and there went almost no more atmosphere on Mars. So it's a completely different planet. We had only a few thousands of million, uh, thousands of years ago. And even more interesting, as you all know, is the early Mars planet, the one that was uh, existing before three billion years ago. Uh, this one was completely different. If you go on a topography map of Mars, you may have seen that before. Some areas of Mars are um, with the, almost without crater. These are relatively recent, but the highlands here in red are very craterized. That means they are very old. They are older than 3 billion years. And when we look at this old ancient terrain, everywhere you look at, you can see, as you all know, uh, traces of rivers and indication that there were some rivers and lakes at the time. These are uh, old pictures, but since then we have had a lot of uh, data coming about lakes, sediments from the surface, for instance, by Curiosity, which has reported, uh, which has been exploring a dry lake and uh, explain, uh, demonstrating that these lakes were suitable for relatively not too acidic liquid water and so on, so on. So that based on not only geomorphology, but also mineralogy, observation of sulfate salts, and in particular phyllosilicates, in other words, clays. Mars three, four billion years ago was relatively uh, uh, suitable for uh, lakes and, and rivers, and so suitable for life, maybe. So it's very exciting, but lots of questions remain, in spite of all the data sets we have. We don't know if it, the water was episodic and or present there uh, very often. We don't know if uh, a lot of the minerals and the action we see was underground or was it really on the surface? But we know that there were rivers and lakes at least episodically, and that's very exciting. So of course, this is connected to a lot of enigmas, of the main one being where there did something started, something related to biology or pre-biology, we all know that. Another big enigma I have to, I wanted to mention, is the fact that we don't understand how Mars could have been suitable for liquid water at the time. Because the typical scenario is that we probably, the atmosphere was thicker than today. It was probably easily a CO2 atmosphere. But we have demonstrated using climate modeling that a Seattle atmosphere is not enough. The greenhouse effect of CO2 atmosphere just with a little bit of water vapor is not sufficient. You need something else. And this something else is not well understood. We've been working on a lot of scenarios related to the very special greenhouse effect of CO2 ice clouds that reflect infrared radiation. We've been working on the impact of impact on the climate. Um, a lot of things has been uh, studied by, the, by various uh, people in the community. And so there have been a debate whether Mars was really warm and wet or whether there were some glaciers that people say, well, but we don't see traces of glacier. And the debate is quite hot. Uh, a few years ago, in fact, uh, an editor from Nature Geoscience wrote an article named 
uh, on Titan Mars at war, suggesting that the debate about the climate of early Mars was so hot that we were at war. Of course, it was wrong. We are, so we had to reply to that with my colleague Robin Wasworth, and we had to explain, no, it's a healthy debate. But this illustrates to you that there is, a, there is some uh, uh, question, enigmas that we have to understand where what happened then? It's mysterious. One scenario that is quite popular these days is, and I won't have time to detail it, maybe I will, is the idea that maybe uh, the mantle of Mars was very reducing so that when you had a lot of volcanic activities, which was the case at the time, not only you had outgassing of water, of CO2, but also hydrogen. And we found that uh, hydrogen, uh, which is not the greenhouse gas by itself, when it's, uh, the pressure is high enough, the collision-induced absorption of hydrogen induces a significant greenhouse effect, which is quite promising. So we're working on that with various teams, and we find that indeed it, this would work, but it's not, it has some problems because you really need a special uh, volcanic activity. So it's, it, other possibilities might be found in the future. Finally, Another big enigma that we have on Mars is <laughs> why Mars did not meet Earth's face. In other words, why Mars evolved as it is today with a thin atmosphere, cold temperature, very dry climate. And this is, of course, related to the fact that Mars did lose its atmosphere. Why has Mars lost its atmosphere? This is a big topic of research. Uh, the, the, the initial atmosphere of Mars may have reacted with the liquid water that was present at the time and created, for instance, carbonates that because there is no plate tectonics get trapped on the surface, but we don't find much carbonate. Another possibility that Mars did lose its atmosphere by atmospheric escape. And this has been the topic of many investigations starting with Mars Express, but in particular, the MAVEN NAVA mission uh, has been really designed to, to, uh, to understand that. And what it find was something not easy to <laughs> extrapolate in time. Some, the, the, a lot of very complex process um, operating uh, related to photochemistry, erosion by solar wind, a process named sputtering when you, but the magnetic field of solar wind accelerates ions in the exosphere. It's quite a complex process. And I don't have time to detail that, but you can check the review papers by Bruce Tchaikovsky, the PI of Maven that it has published recently. Um, one thing I called advertise is the fact that you may have heard about this, but you have to understand the, the stories. You have a lot of paradigm that can change. And I advertise two very recent paper that has been just published as part of a of a space science review, a topical collection that will become a book from the EC, from the International Space Science Institute in Bern. And the first paper asked the question, did Mars possess a dense atmosphere during the first 400 million years? It's not the first to ask, but the story behind is that you have to, it is very likely that between the creation of Mars 5.5 billion years ago and 4.1 billion years ago, there were no atmosphere on Mars because all the, atmosphere that was outgassed was stripped away by the very intense uh, uh, extreme UV field that you had at the time with the young uh, solar uh, star. And another story is, it is often mentioned that after four billion years ago, a big atmosphere was built through outgassing by volcanoes. And then a typical story that you may have heard of is that then the magnetic field that was present at the time and disappeared then, stop protecting the atmosphere from erosion by the solar wind, and then the atmosphere was uh, escaped away. But no uh, expert like uh, the Urbin Rastad and Stash Barabas from the Mars Express team suggest that no, in magnetic field do not protect planetary atmosphere from solar wind. So the, it's not really true to imagine that everything is connected to the, to the magnetic field of the planet protecting a planet like Mars. It's maybe wrong. Okay, I'm just finishing now. I will be happy to, to take some of questions if you, if you have time. Yes, thank you very much for very nice photos and very good talk. Lex, can you check questions, please? Yes, uh, so I'm also very impressed by these uh, beautiful images of the surface of Mars. There are a few questions I have to swap, swap back and forth. There is a question by Alexander Shulevsky. What do you think about pitches to establish human settlements on Mars? 
for example, would enough water be easily accessible to the colonists? <laughs> Pitchers. I think I know what uh, it is true that uh, on Mars, just like on the moon, in fact, uh, you find very spectacular uh, uh, hole <laughs> in the ground. And they are related to the fact that when you have a lava flow, sometimes you have a lava tube where you have liquid lava flowing and then the lava disappear and sometimes you have collapse. And then suddenly you have access to very <laughs> interesting cave and it has been uh, speculated and suggested that uh, it could be interesting to have uh, uh, habitats for the astronaut there because uh, you could build a, uh, it would be interesting to have pressurized habitats protected from radiation. But to start with, my bet is that we will go simpler and just have uh, habitats on the surface. The radiation rate on the surface is not that terrible when you don't stay for years. So I think uh, we won't go there straight away, but if you, in the very long distant future when people will stay for a long time on Mars, maybe it will be a good solution. I Thank hope that was the question. <laughs> yeah, so there is another question. That's by Pavel Krupa. He says that uh, the younger sun three and more giga year ago was also less bright. Is it known how this affected the early climate of Mars? Would this not make it even more challenging to have rivers and lakes? Yeah, the same for Earth, should it not have been frozen? Absolutely, that's part of the early Mars climate enigma. Not only Mars is further, further away from the sun than, than the Earth, but of course the sun went fainter and it's at the earth of the, at the heart of the, the, this problem. It's, uh, it will be easier with the present day sun, for instance. I think there will not be any enigma, but with the, as you know, yes, the, the, the younger sun was, uh, was uh, less bright, uh, a little smaller in fact, and uh, and, in, and uh, this is part of the, of the problem. And there have been, in fact, and, uh, some speculation, uh, you can find uh, several papers in the literature, speculating that the solution of the early mass enigma could be that the early sun was uh, more massive than it is today, and it lost its, uh, its mass through a very intense solar wind. And um, I've been studying that quite a lot, so I'm sure some of, if there are some specialists in the audience, they know what I'm talking about. But the problem with this idea is that um, uh, early massive sun has been speculated, but usually it loses its mask very, very early. So that three, 3 billion years ago, for instance, there is or 3.5 billion years ago, there is no way it could be something like, we need something like 5% more massive than now, and it, it's too late. So it, this uh, more massive sun will work uh, very early, but not late enough. That's a, a double answer. <laughs> I, I think we have uh, time for one more question. I also would like to report that we have 519 people listening to your talks. So I think that's amazing. Then the last question is by Anders Johansson. Is there any geological production of methane on Earth that can be used to understand methane on Mars? Yeah, if, if I, I understand the question being, um, is there a way to explain uh, methane of Mars through something which is not biological, of course? So a first possibility, if you have a really small amount, is just to imagine that you have a, a meteorites bringing uh, organic material and then it's processed by UV radiation at warmer temperature and can create methane, but that's speculation. The, but to see if the plumes of methane that we see going up to 10, 20 parts per billion that has been monitored remotely and by a curiosity, then you need a source of methane that destroy methane quite efficient and a, a, a way to destroy it. So this source has to be important. So if we imagine it's a non-biological source, then we have to relate it to volcanic sources, serpentinization process, for instance, related to what's going on on the earth. There are some sources that are not biological on the Earth related to volcanoes. But the problem is that we made an estimation of what you, what you need to explain some of the observation. But you need the equivalent of the entire uh, ridge on the middle of the Atlantic Ocean to produce as much methane as what you will need to have a regular burst of methane as observed on Mars. So it's a, it's a mystery. So uh, I hope I answered this question as well. Thanks Thank very much, Francois. Back to you. Thank you very much. Now we have to move from Mars to Earth. And the next speaker is Javier Barco, 
and he will tell us about ESA program status updates. Welcome. Hello, Agatha. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks very much for the invitation. I will have to fly over my slides during the next 12 minutes um, uh, to update you on what's happened at ESO during the last year. Um, so maybe first uh, important thing to realize is that uh, the community that we serve was pretty busy writing papers and producing science. Um, uh, more than 1,000 reflect papers emerged during 2020 out of ESO data. This is something that makes us very happy. Um, just to underline, 35% of those papers make use of the ESO archive, the science archive facility, and half of those only of archival data. That, that's very important. So we're giving really a second life to this data that, that it's so hard to take. Um, just uh, uh, to underline, the ESO Science Archive Facility now serves together uh, La Silla Paranal Observatory and Alma Data. So you get the, 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 uh, the whole lot uh, when, you, when you click in our archive. There were a big number of science breakthroughs. Of course, I, I can not forget to um, celebrate the um, a Nobel Prize in Physics given to uh, Ragnar Gensel, that we're going to listen to in a moment, um, Andrea Ges. Uh, and um, for, the, uh, for, for the supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy, and that ESO had a big role in the observations done by, uh, by Reinhardt and, and his group, but also many other breakthroughs, and I've quoted here four or five, with apologies to the other thousand that I didn't have uh, time to quote, uh, but this, this was all very good. Um, we've been working through this pandemic in ways to uh, keep the engagement with the community. Uh, I just want to flag a couple of them here, uh, the Cosmic Duologues, where we have two prominent members of the community debating on specific high-level topic. Those are very um, uh, closely followed and very popular um, uh, debates and, and very fruitful. Uh, we also launched something called the Ipatia Colloquium, where we invite early career scientists to present their plans. And we also invite, of course, um, the project leads and institute directors to uh, strengthen um, uh, hiring opportunities. And uh, since uh, our observatories are not open to visits uh, now for a year and a half, we're also offering virtual observatory tours uh, every week. Uh, and we're even going to open um, very shortly educational tours uh, in virtual form to our observatories. Just uh, a short advertisement from our communication group. You have an interesting uh, result coming up, please contact them. And just to underline, we're very happy to support our diversity policy on this. And we, we welcome especially, um, uh, but all of, of course, all, all results, but those um, um, uh, led by uh, women, by people from all nationalities, and by uh, by scientists from all levels of seniority and please do contact the people if you have something nice coming up um, just a brief report on what went uh, about in the la silla paranal observatory we had to shut down the observatory for six months to put it under um, a very uh, low staffing plan and just keep the systems alive uh, we were very happy to resume observations in in september um, but of course, uh, we had to lose six months of, of data. Um, at the moment, uh, we're doing observations with most of the telescopes, not all of them. We cannot send enough stuff to do this. Uh, we have to follow closely the regulations in, uh, in Chile, where the situation with the pandemic is not very good, but still a uh, very good science outcome during uh, the, the last semester. Um, at the expense, of course, of postponing measured technical interventions that we will have to tackle at some point. Um, just a heads up that uh, the current APEX and VSD agreements expire next year. Uh, so we're discussing with our partners, with the Max Planck Institute of Radio Astronomy, uh, with enough about options to extend this, but those options would be without um, um, uh, contributions from ESO and without observing time to the ESO community. So this is the framework in which we're discussing. Our instrumentation program was heavily affected by um, the pandemic, of course. We couldn't finish the projects. Uh, commissioning, installing big things in Paranal was simply not possible, and it's, it is still not possible. Still, we managed to commission um, two of these instruments uh, remotely from Garching with support from the very um, thin staff complement in Paranal, and we also 
uh, doing the same thing now uh, uh, with gravity for Matisse. Um, some of the biggest uh, instruments had to be delayed, in particular Eris. Uh, NIRPS is making good progress with the commissioning, but SOX, Moons, and Foremost are also progressing. Um, we started the upgrade of force, and we started Mavis, the multi-conjugated adaptive optics uh, instrument uh, led by our colleagues in Australia, and, and we are going through the phase A uh, reviews of Cubes and Gravity Plus at the moment. Here's some pictures for you to uh, have a flavor on how difficult it is to run the observatory today under safe conditions, and, uh, and I'm, I'm really very proud of the people that are making this possible. Um, this is also a couple of uh, pictures to show you this um, the remote commissioning activities that are possible for relatively simple instruments. Of course, if you need to install a fully fledged instrument, we need to fly our people to Paranal, which is simply not possible today. Um, a few words about ALMA as well. ALMA had to stop for one year doing science observations. Uh, we started uh, to put together this return to operations plan in in October, um, uh, uh, trying to recover first the operations um, facility camp uh, and then the high site. Uh, the good news is that on the 16th of March, we started to do science observations. We resumed cycle seven observations, but uh, not at full speed. Uh, we're in between best efforts and nominal. Uh, so we're doing observations, but uh, not as much as we would need to complete a cycle seven in full. We believe that we're going to lose about 20% of the observations. And all, in all this time, of course, our regional center um, in Europe, uh, led by ESO, uh, has been providing all the support. Um, about development projects for ALMA, a big uh, thing is, of course, the new correlator that has been identified as, as a, a very important uh, project for the future. Uh, the requirements have been agreed and the project preparations are ongoing and, and we hope to make progress in the coming years. There's also a number of other projects led by ESO and our partners in Europe, and they are all making very good progress, including um, a couple of cases where we are actually ahead of schedule because uh, we could manage to relocate some of the resources and, and we could really make very good progress. Um, again, some, some uh, photos of the site uh, of the operations control room and everything, our transporters had to be fixed during this period. I'm very happy that they are in working order again. So uh, we're, we're doing observations, um, unfortunately not at full speed, as I mentioned. Um, I wanted to put that slide about observing time. This is, as I uh, want to emphasize again, what we delivered to the community. Um, we did very well in La Silla Paranal uh, from October to March uh, last year. Um, we're now sort of struggling, um, delivering lots of science, but not as much as we would like to. This is mostly carry over proposals from period 105 when we couldn't do any observing, plus a special call that we launched um, for really urgent and breakthrough proposals uh, for the next uh, semesters. Um, we uh, did the, um, the review and the assessment by the OPC through dual anonymous review process. We believe this, that has worked very well. Um, and the scheduling, which is, of course, always a nightmare, it's on, ongoing at the moment. Cycle seven for ALMA, I mentioned cycle eight, uh, not the record number of proposals, but certainly the record number of large program proposals, 40, highest over subscription ever, six above six overall. And uh, actually ALMA already featured the distributed proposal review for the uh, proposals requesting uh, uh, longer time um, exposures and we're going to implement similar scheme for the La Silla Paranal as well. I also wanted to um, tell you that we're making good progress to offer dual time allocation channels with ALMA and other facilities, including the VLT and the VLTI, probably with facilities in other um, executives in other regions of ALMA. And the ultimate goal is also to be able to offer dual time allocation, uh, a dual time allocation channel with J. Uh, WSC, if we can manage together with NASA and ESA. Um, uh, we're, of course, spending a lot of effort building the ELT. As you know, very good news. Uh, our council um, approved our request to provide additional funding to secure the full funding of the project in December last year. We're making really very good progress with the manufacturing in Europe. Um, one figure to quote here is that the glass uh, of 20% of the segments has already been uh, produced and has been delivered to the polisher. And we have a full set of six uh, 
uh, mirror shells for the M4 already delivered. So uh, those are just examples. Um, the dome and the main structure, the biggest uh, contract in ground-based astronomy ever placed. It's, of course, um, always the highest programmatic schedule and cost risk. There's very good progress with the final design review of the telescope structure. This year, the dome and the auxiliary building are in construction, but of course, we had to stop the on-site work in July, and it's uh, now restarting. So this, this work already ongoing at Amazonas. The M5 <clears throat> remains our highest technical risk. It has always been. At the moment, we're going through a relatively good phase where we see good progress. So that's that's uh, not that the concern is evaporated, but, but we're really happy with the way it's going. Uh, our instruments are all under review this year. Uh, final design review for Mikado and Harmony. Uh, Met is starting also, and Maori, which is delayed. It's uh, undergoing preliminary design review at the moment, and we hope that we find we will find a way to start the new generation instruments next year, uh, HIRES and Mosaic in particular. Of course, due to COVID and a number of other issues, we had to update our reference schedule for the ELT. We also changed the milestone. We have moved away from this first technical light that uh, no one knew exactly what it meant. We, we now refer to the first science light, which is the start of science verification of the first instrument after the telescope has been commissioned commissioned and we are now putting this on in September 2027, well ahead of first science light of any of the other ELTs uh, led by North America. This is a view of the Amazonas summit. Uh, there's on work, there's work ongoing here. You can see a crane, people there restarting work. Um, here's uh, some hardware produced in Europe. This is one of the 36 trolleys that will move the dome. Each one of them weights 27 tons and you can see that uh, they are very well uh, manufactured. They can be moved along these rails very well. Um, this is also um, a tribute to the progress of the M1 of the primary mirror. All these boxes are full of um, blanks for the segments. There's six in each one of them, more than 200 have been delivered. You can also see the pads uh, behind the, um, the blanks when they are delivered to the polisher, then uh, the cuts uh, to make the hexagons and uh, to put them into the frames into the supports and then all the polishing um, all the polishing process at Safran, which has already been qualified and it's ongoing for, for a number of those segments. And more progress, of course, on the rest of the optomechanics, just to give you uh, examples. And here I also wanted to show the test stand that we have here in Garsing in our integration hall. You can see this six, uh, sorry, seven dummy uh, M1 segments. Uh, those are equivalent to 1% of the collecting surface of the ELT, and we're testing all the control loops, all the actuators, edge sensors, and all the all the control, essentially, of the mirror. This is an incredibly challenging but important task. Um, one thing we realize we have to do is to adapt uh, the way we operate uh, in Paranal. Uh, it wouldn't be sustainable to operate the VLT and the ELT in the way we're doing the VLT today. That would simply explode and be unsustainable in terms of in terms of cost and in terms of, of environmental sustainability and many other topics. So we are looking at uh, a new model to operate where uh, most of the activity is done remotely and we minimize the people that have to be at the site. So this is only starting phase A now, but we believe that this, this, this is really the only way forward for this big observatory that will encompass on top of it CTA South. Um, now, uh, I think this is almost my last minutes. slide. Yeah, that's good. I'm one slide away of finishing. Um, very happy to also report to you that last year at the December Council meeting, uh, the strategy for the next decade was approved. We need to put this into context. Uh, in this strategic plan uh, hierarchy or the mission of ISO that's pretty clear in the convention. It's to build and operate world-class astronomical facilities and foster collaboration in astronomy. Um, the vision today is to deliver the ELT, uh, uh, keeping the VLT and ALMA um, at the forefront of astronomy. This needs to be updated in the coming years and council is aware of this. Our values, we're working on them and in, in a good formulation of our values, and we will release this formulation later in, in the year and the strategy for the next decade. This is what was approved. And it's 
working around these four bullets, um, top priority or, you know, well, they're all equal priority, but uh, of course, very importantly, implement and operate the ELT. Second, ensure that the current facilities remain at the forefront. Third, prepare um, and keep the organization fit for purpose to not only operate our facilities, but maybe to be able to uh, engage in a new one when the financial conditions enable, which is not the case today. And finally, retain ESO's leadership role in astronomy in a multiplicity of facets. And you can find all this strategy in the last issue of the messenger. And uh, before leaving, I will recommend to you that you read the annual report of 2020, which you can find in that link. It was released yesterday, and it's, as always, very good reading and a tribute to the people who prepare it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javier. Um, unfortunately, we have no time for, for questions, but all questions will be moved to Slack channel, which is still okay. open and you can, you can open directly in the Slack. We have to move forward. Uh, now I invite uh, Frank Eisenhower. However, he will tell us about Ian Sticho Brahe medal, the universe in 3D motion from symphony to gravity and towards the future. Frank, welcome very much. I think, Frank, you still have to unmute. You're muted, Frank. Yeah. Okay, now it should work. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you please give your sign? Yes, it does. Yes. Super, sure. thank you very much. Dear President, members of the society, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a great pleasure and honor for me to be here and present to you the Gravity and Symphony Instruments. Thank you so much for recognizing the achievements with the Tycho Brahe Prize. And this goes to the Gravity and Symphony teams, which you see here on the slide. Indeed, we have many members in the team, too many friends and colleagues to introduce individually. So I would like to go by the participating institutes and show a few examples of many who've built the instrument and brought home the science. At MPE, we are the group around Reinhard Genzel. In France, we have the observatory in Paris, in Grenoble, around Guy Parent, in Karine Parent. We have the European Suffered Observatory, which is not only hosting the instruments, but also was substantially contributing to the development. In Germany, we have the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg, the University in Cologne, in Portugal, the universities of Porto and Lisbon, and Astron in the Netherlands to help. So to introduce the topic of symphony and gravity, please let me go a bit back in time to the 90s. So this was a wonderful epoch of experimental astronomies, large format detectors coming in place, adaptive optics, arriving astronomy, and the first steps towards imaging spectroscopy. All of that led to a wonderful time where we could travel around the world to the observatories, install new instruments every year, and new discoveries coming with them every year. Here you see a few examples, the sharp cameras at the NTT in La Silla, the MPE spectrograph at the 2.2 meter in La Silla, and on the lower side, the NERC instrument or the Keck telescope. And this led to fantastic discoveries, for example, of the stars around the galactic center black hole, their motions, and then the spectra. So how could we bring this era of experimental astronomies to the new eight to 10 meter telescopes which were arriving, which everything was larger and took longer? And the way for us was the symphony proposal. So this was a proposal by a small group from MPE and ESO for symphony in 1997, which is an adaptive optics imaging spectrograph for the VLT. There were a number of decisions to made in the early phase of the project, and they were going along the theme, which you can see every photon, every pixel matters. For the adaptive optics, for example, at that time, we had not yet the noiseless CCDs available for a very Chakartman wavefront sensor to go for faint objects. 
Instead, what we did is we were going for avalanche photo diets, each of them individually connected with fibers, a beautiful work and development by our colleagues at ESO. Also the integral field spectroscopy side, there were a number of choices to make. So integral field spectroscopy is a technique where you observe a spectrum for every pixel of your image. You can do that either with a lenslet or you can use fibers to reroute the light or the way we've then finally done it in Symphony, a technique called image slicing. So this technique was developed for the infrared at our group in the 90s. And the way you do it is you have a set of small mirrors in the focal plane here seen on the top right, which literally slice the focal plane of the telescope in lines, send the light in different direction. And then you have a large, a second set of larger mirrors on the left, the form of soil along state, which is sent to a spectrograph. The big advantage of this technique, while more bulky, is that you really use every photon which arrives in the detector, and you optimally use the detector so you can use actually every pixel of the detector. And as such, this technique has now become the technique of choice for many instruments on ground in space. For example, the Pax spectrometer on the Herschel Space Telescope, the upcoming NERSPEC on James Webb to come, but also for optical, for example, in use at the VLT in Paranal. So there are many routes to success. The one for Symphony was to be fast track. And if I remember well, I would say the most critical phase of our project was around 2000. So this was a time when there was very rapid and major advance, especially on the galactic center, with discovery of accelerations in 2000, flares in X-rays in 2001, discovery of the orbits. So absolutely, let's not miss the opportunity. At the same time, there were what I would call the normal unforeseeable for a project which opens up a new parameter space. Manufacturing, but maybe even a better example is what you see here in the middle is, initially we wanted to go with fibers to feed the spectrograph. And after very encouraging results for a few of them, in the end, we couldn't port this technology to make a thousand of them. And so we had to make decisions. And this was then the way, or I would say with three elements to path the way to success. Number one was to allow for changes in the instrument design along you go. Very often you actually have to decide without having incomplete knowledge at hand or numbers. So here you decide by experience and one of the key for Symphony was a phased implementation. So indeed we could go first with the spectrograph to the telescope in 2003, this is called Spiffy, to bring home the first results of the galactic sender, then bring the adaptive optics in 2004 and in 2006, then add the laser guide star to open up the extra galactic sky for Symphony. So the advantage and big success of this phase implementation was that with every phase we could improve the instrument and at the same time bring home fantastic science. Let me start with the galactic sender. So this was the time where we could do the spectroscopy of all the stars in the central light months and farther out to determine the 3D velocity and therefore the orbits of the stars. The time where we could do for the first time spectroscopy of the flaring black hole shown on the left. A few years later, the discovery of a gas cloud falling towards the galactic center black hole and so on and so on. And also the high redshift, there was fantastic results to share. So in 2005, 2006, we could for the first time at adaptive optics resolution uh, derive the 2D velocity fields of galaxies in the early universe at a redshift beyond two. And other than what was expected from a simple hierarchical structure formation in the universe, what we found was rotating very massive disks already that early in the universe. So this led then to very substantial surveys of the, over the next 10 years from the community and from our team to bring home velocity fields of hundreds of these galaxies at redshift around two and beyond. Several of them now have exposure times of more than up to 40 hours on the source and yet another surprise to arrive these days. Other than in the local universe, this rotating disk 
do not all of them have flat rotation curves out there, which indicate the dark matter dominated dynamics. Instead, we find a significant fraction that the velocities falls off at larger distance, therefore indicating that the dynamics is dominated by baryons rather than dark matter. So all of that, let me now go to the next project, to gravity. So we are in 2005. What was the landscape in 2005? So let me touch on three things on observations for the galactic center, which you see on the top left. What you had was half a dozen of stellar orbits and repeated observations of the flaring activity from the black hole itself. So this triggered tremendous interest in the theory community, which then at the same time developed a very solid theoretical understanding and framework to interpret. On the technology side, we've seen the advance of interferometry coming, 10 micro arcs angstrometry from the PTI, first interferometric images from the surface of stars, and at the ESO first steps towards phase referencing. So if you take that together, it was clear where to go with the galactic center. If you come to micro arc second astrometry and to milli arc second imaging, we will be able to measure the motion close to the event horizon of the black hole and to measure the effects of relativity in the stellar orbits. And so in 2005, we submitted this proposal for gravity in AO assisted beam combiner instrument for the VLTI. So what is gravity in the VLTI? In very simple words, you could say it's the world's largest and sharpest optical infrared telescope. By combining the light from the 4 8 meter telescope, we can reach milli arc second resolution imaging, micro arc second astrometry, and all of that are 1,000 times more sensitive than earlier interferometers. How do we do that? Well, you see here the principle you bring in together the light to form double slit experiments in the end, like Michelson. But the real technical challenge is what you see here, the beam combiner instrument, which is in the center of the observatory. This is the gravity beam combiner. And to illustrate what you all have to do, let's follow the light for one of the telescope before we actually bring them together. So we have to control all of the wavefront operations. We have adaptive optics along the line. We send laser beacons up and down in the observatory from the instrument to the telescope. We diagnose this light, this is a, a unit which you see here, to control the beam all the way then to nanometer accuracy and so on. So far we've prepared the light. Now let's combine the light from the different telescopes. To that we are using single mode fibers, like you know from telecommunication. But other than here, we had to make our own fibers because we work at two microns, so they are fluoride glass. Fibers are ideal because for example, you can adjust the path lengths to nanometer precision by stretching them, is what you've seen here. Or by literally twisting the fibers to rotate the polarization of the light. So you do all of that for the for telescopes, and then you arrive for the actual beam combination, aligned to a fraction of the wavelength and the polarization together. And then you do now like Michelson with beam splitters and combiners, but now differently, not in bulk optics with mirrors, but for us with a technique which we call integrated optics, the equivalent of electronic integrated circuits, where we imprint the function in a little piece of glass to do the interferogram in the end, where we get a spectrum and then project on a normal, normal detector in the infrared. So in the end, the data looks like that. For each pair of telescopes, so we have six pairs in different colors, you measure the strength and the position of the interference. And you do that for different, this is in different colors here. And then for each of that, you do that for different wavelengths, the different symbols. What you measure with each of the, the points is the uh, one Fourier component of the source distribution. So you repeat that several times per night, and in the end you can invert, and your result in an image, what you see here, like in radio interferometry. You also have a, a not so nice background, which you clean away with the computer, and then you end up with an image. In this example, a star orbiting the black hole in the center of the galaxy. And this was in 2016, 17, just in time for entering. 
testing the black hole paradigm. And uh, again, like I said before, we are so proud to have been able to participate to the Nobel Prize here to Rainer Gensel, Andrea Gess, and Roger Penrose for testing the black hole paradigm. The experiment is very simple. You follow the star, and from Kepler laws, you derive the mass. But now with gravity, we could go beyond what you could do with a single telescope. With 20 times better angular resolution, we could continuously see the black hole. We had 20 micro to 100 micro arc second orbit position. And we've seen the star move from day to day, which then allows together with the symphony spectroscopy to pin down the mass and distance to a fraction of a percent. And then with the same experiment, for example, if you look on the spectroscopy from symphony and having the orbit from gravity, get the gravitational redshift. Now we are beyond the 30 sigma in the detection or in the left, the so-called Schwarzschild precession that the star actually is getting in a new orbit each time it's reached, coming close to the black hole. But we can also say that it's really a black hole because that mass of 4 million solar masses must be enclosed in a very small volume. So this is a measurement now over one hour, again showing the separation between the star and the black hole. But in one hour, the star doesn't move. What you see moving here is hot gas around the black hole. In 45 minutes, it's 30% the speed of light at a few Schwarzschild uh, radii. So the picture we have in mind is there's magnetic reconnection, which we trace in the infrared and in the X-ray, for example. So this all brought us to a revolution in high angular resolution astronomy with gravity. Just a few highlights from the last year. The first resolution of a micro lens to measure the mass of the object here. More than a dozen of papers on young stellar objects, the Tauri stars, to understand star formation. Exoplanets, I'll come to that we touched on the galactic center, but also now images from HEN, like 1068, and resolving the broad light reaching quasars billion light years away. And this gives me the opportunity to recognize the history. So all of that was foreseen in, in a remarkable and beautiful way by the implementation team for the VLTI around Chuck Becker. So in 1989, they already laid out what we have to do with gravity. And you see the science case is ticked off by now. Galactic center, the image of 1068, and resolve the broad line region. Beautiful. But there were also things which are not foreseen. Exoplanets not known at the time. And so we are very proud now that with gravity, we can also enter in this field and add very substantially. Here you see an example of beta pic B where originally one planet was known, which you see on the top left, adaptive optics image. Maybe now with gravity, almost using as a coronagraph, very well, they can distinguish photons from the star and the planets, get spectra to understand the formation history. And even maybe more proud, we are on a first direct detection of a radial velocity planet, something which you don't see in the upper left image, but which we could made out with gravity. So why did it take so long? Because it's difficult and I don't want to go into the details, but if you compare to radio in the photometry, for example, you have to, everything is a, a few the orders of magnitude more difficult. So you see it, this is why it was so hard. A few challenges we were facing during the project, too many to, to go to many of them, but one physically very interesting was the laser backscattering. So, to do in the photometry, we have to measure the distance between the instrument and the telescopes to nanometer. So we check the laser through the fibers, which you've seen before. But then what happened is actually light was coming back at a wavelength, which was not the wavelength of the laser. It was coming right in the cape and where we wanted to observe, saturating the detectors. So this is fluorescence from contamination in the fibers, from rare earth elements and Raman scattering on the phonons. And again, in the photometry health. So what in the end we could do is we could launch an other beam outside way brighter order of magnitudes, which acts as an amplifier by interfering with the original beam to measure the distance. And so we could dim the laser to a level we come to the background of the observatory. So this is only one example of the many unknowns, and indeed system model is facing its limit for this complex experiment. Also, you have thousands of active elements in Paranal, for example. So it's not clear from the analysis what will be your worst offenders. So for us, the key was to go back to experimental physics, 
learn and iterate on the site, on the system and go on site. So where to go from here? Well, towards the future. Learn, what do we learn from on the site? This is the observatory as you know it right now. And what we learn is de facto the same as we've done with adaptive optics. To achieve a full sky coverage and to go to the faintest objects, you need laser guide stars. And you need to have a bright enough star to stabilize your control loops. This is a technique called off-axis fringe tracking. And we need a better adaptive optics. Ours is 20 years old. It actually has a prerequisite to go deep. And this is the Gravity Plus project. So we submitted a proposal in 2019. Currently, we are already building up the first prototypes. And we are together with ESO, we are exploring the possibility for the implementation in the next years. Just a few highlights already, just before the COVID, we could demonstrate this off-axis operation for the first time with four telescopes worldwide. We have upgraded the instrument partially already. And we will bring the ELT concept of laser guide stars to the other three telescopes. With that, and this is my last slide already to end, we are looking forward to a wonderful time in, in optical infrared in the photometry. We will have 100 of quasars accessible to measure the broad line, binary black holes at redshift up to two or even beyond, substantially increase the number of exoplanets accessible and open completely new science, for example, on microlensing to measure the mass of unseen isolated stellar black holes. And with that, I would thank you very much again. Thank you for the award and thank you for listening in. I'm happy to take your questions. Yes, but we have minus three minutes, but maybe one question, Lex, if you can provide, because I don't like... Well, I think we first have to say that uh, Frank really is the champion of optical instrumentation. Right. I think okay. this is really amazing what has been presented. Well, some of us already have seen some of it, but Frank, you again make me really make me think very small. If well, I it's not me, it's the team behind. It's really great. So there is one question uh, from... Uh, uh, Pavel Krupa, that is about uh, a detailed uh, interpretation of uh, the work, of course, related to the galactic center. It's about uh, the inner bright Newtonian rise and peak. And um, it is indeed seen in nearby massive disk galaxies, even for the Milky Way, and that the fainter outer flat, and that is then really in relation, of course, to Milogrim and Mont, part has not yet been observed. So concerning the breakthrough high redshift rotation, galactic rotation curve, is it not so that you have only been able to observe the inner bright part? <laughs> well, I'm not really an expert in that field. For me, the, uh, the answer is no. It's, it's truly what we observe is the lack of dark matter. Indeed, you have to, to correct for the, for, for, the, for the pressure support of these disks, which is large at high redshift. But please, I refer to the work of, of Reinhard Gensel and, and Natasha Foster Schreiber to, to ask this question. Yes, yeah, thank you. Frank, of course, there are many things that uh, we would like to discuss, but as the chair said, uh, we have only limited time. So I would appreciate it very much if you could answer the uh, remaining questions uh, through Slack. Lex, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. We still oh. have time for a question. I, I was really sorry. trying to catch up, as you've seen in the speed of my talk, <laughs> but it's fine. Because I thought that this that you have 15 minutes talk, but now I see no, you have half an hour. Uh, it's going fine, uh, Agatha. So let's just go on. So there is another question, Frank. Please. That is by Trisha Baumik. Maybe a naive question. Do you think space is ex starling? project will affect ground-based observation from VLT and other telescopes? Well, it uh, will affect the wide field work. It will not affect the interferometry. You know, our field of view is less than arc seconds, so we will be the ones who actually will not suffer from that. But the situation is very different from the sky service, for example. Yeah, so uh, I had a question myself, Frank, uh, that is, of course, also in relation to uh, Javier's talk and uh, the work you have been doing. So I think you have clearly demonstrated with your team that the VLTI has really been worth it to make it happen with the VLT, Low Walter's original idea to have four telescopes rather than one. But so you already looked a little bit ahead in future, but so we really can make another step with VLTI regarding instrumentation or is this really the best you, you can do? 
No, we can do another, other steps. So let's now first take the first step. This is this gravity plus. So to actually really get the uh, full sky coverage and do everything that we are perfect in keeping. And then if you have that under control, you can, for example, go to shorter wavelengths to one micron, which doubles the resolution. We can think of adding a, a telescope really because at, a, at that angle a resolution of a hundred, few hundred meter telescopes, we at some point will reach the same limit as radio interferometry. The ELT might be the last of its kind as a single aperture to come. I can't tell whether interferometry will do the job in the next 20 years or 50 years, but it's clear that just from the physics, there's a limit to the single apertures to come. Yeah, so I didn't see any remaining questions, but I, I just had this other one and that is probably totally naive. And so the, the ELT will be of course uh, several kilometers away. Is there anything that you could think of that you could combine even uh, the VLT with the ELT in this way? Well, I think in principle one could. So there were already original attempts, you know, on, on Mauna Kea in Hawaii to combine the telescope from the periscope there. Scientifically, I'm not sure whether this is, is a good way to link the ELT to the VLT because you have such a big separation that, that you are you're missing all the information in between. So you would have a very particular science case with a very simple object de facto dominated by it. The two objects, a star around the black hole could be one, but typically I would say this is too far away. You, you, we need a more moderate departure, maybe a few hundred meters up to a kilometer with several telescopes, this would be the way forward. So thanks very much, uh, Frank. Also, of course, uh, congratulations with this uh, great achievement and uh, uh, the Tycho Brahe medal, of course. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Lex. Agatha, it's back to you Thank then. Thank you very much. And I'm really sorry again. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a pleasure to be with up. you. Uh, of course, now I'm sure we have 30 minutes talk by Laura Penterici. And she will tell us about probing the epoch of rayonization with galaxies and quasars. Laura, very welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I hope you see my screen. Yes, we do. Okay, great. So uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here today and uh, speak up the end of this great week of science. Uh, we've seen really many exciting results. And uh, I will uh, bring you now to uh, a little bit further in time, uh, so to the cosmic realization epoch, so uh, back to the very first epochs of the universe. I, uh, I see, think most or more or less people are familiar with picture like this. This is the way we, we figure out realization uh, happened. The realization is this transition from uh, the completely neutral IGM. So after recombination, we know that the universe was completely neutral, full of uh, uh, hydrogen and, and helium. And then after a bit, the first in the so-called dark ages, the first stars started to form and ionize their surrounding. And as a larger structures like galaxies and quasars formed and produced increasingly larger ionized bubbles, eventually this, all these bubbles uh, overlapped and uh, the IGM was completely ionized again. At, uh, a time when the universe was about one giga years old. So uh, we have still many, many questions about this, uh, this uh, fascinating epoch. Of course, we don't know exactly how, when cosmic realization occurred, and if it was a process that was uh, uh, fast or, or, or slow, and also in, in uh, whether it was a uh, homogeneous uh, transition in space or, or maybe it was more patchy. And of course, the other big question is uh, which were the sources that were providing this, this budget? Was it mostly galaxies or, or quasars or, or a combination of them? So today we'll res uh, show you some results from uh, the deep uh, spectroscopic observation that we've been carried out in the, in the past uh, 10 years. And of course, I will briefly touch on what's coming next in the very, very near future. So uh, about the question of when uh, our realization occurred, uh, so our current knowledge basically comes from two classes of probes. On one hand, we have the constraint from the observation of the cosmic microwave background, so in the form of the Thomson uh, optical depth. And results from Planck uh, tells us that the midpoint of realization was around Redshift 7.7, .7, and the realization was uh, some, somehow 
happening fast and late. This is at least, uh, uh, these are the latest results uh, compared to the earlier results that told us that realization was, uh, was much earlier in time, which pro uh, gave also some problems to match with the observations of galaxies. On the other hand, we have observations, as I said, of early galaxies, but also quasars and GRBs. I will also only concentrate on galaxies today, but quasars and GRBs also provide constraint. And these observations allow us to measure another quantity, which is the IgM neutral hydrogen content, so the fraction of neutral hydrogen that is contained in the IgM at a given redshift and for a given light of sight. So uh, one of the primary tools uh, uh, of the main tools of, uh, that we've used to probe realization is the Lyman alpha emission. This is a UV line that, of course, is shifted to the optical and then the near infrared as we go higher in redshift. And it's a very powerful tool in general to, to probe uh, galaxies, to probe distant galaxies, because it, uh, it often appears in emission and is a bright line. So it can be, uh, uh, it can be detected quite easily. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, produced by a massive star. So it should be present in all very young uh, star forming galaxies. Of course, it's also produced by AGN and other mechanisms like uh, shock heating and cold accretion can contribute. But in general, we think that in a, dust, uh, in a young stellar population, so in a young star forming galaxy with, with not much dust, there should be a lot of Lyman alpha. However, observationally, we see that uh, Lyman alpha is not present, for example, at Regi 2 or 3. Lyman alpha is not present in all galaxies. So in some galaxies, as you see here in this top panel, these are Regi 3 galaxies, they, it, it appears in emission, and in some other galaxies, it appears in absorption. And the reason is that Lyman alpha photons can be reasonably scattered and are also very easily absorbed by, by dust. So the presence of, uh, and also the shape of the Lyman alpha, which is usually asymmetric in a, in a galaxy, in a star forming galaxy, depend on many things. For example, the, the dust content, the dust distribution, the, um, uh, the column density of neutral hydrogen, the outflowing uh, gas, so the, the, the kinematics of the gas present in the, in the, in the galaxy, so many things. And, and, and we can model this, for example, with radiative transfer simulations or with, uh, with the more simple analytical models. Um, in any case, what we see observationally is that as we move to higher and higher redshift to earlier epochs, the Lyman alpha emission is more frequently appearing in, in star forming galaxies. So, for example, at, at redshift 2, we have only about 10% of galaxies, star forming galaxies exhibiting Lyman alpha in emission. But some, some results tell us that the redshift 6, 5, and 6, 50% of the, Lyman, of the uh, galaxies, star forming galaxies, star forming galaxies have Lyman alpha. This can be easily explained because if you move to area redshift, the galaxies are, uh, of course, younger on average, uh, and they also have had less time to form dust. So the Lyman alpha is more easily uh, escaping from the galaxies. And indeed, this is a, a figure from a recent review by Masami Uchi uh, showing that more, many of the most distant galaxies we are coming here to redshift seven and eight have been confirmed through Lyman alpha emission. Not all of them, we are starting to see new results from ALMA that we've seen, for example, this week, but, but many galaxies have Lyman alpha. And Lyman alpha is a tool to confirm their distance, confirm their edges, and maybe study their properties. Lyman alpha, as I say, is also a powerful tool to probe the end of ionization. Why is that? As we enter the epoch when uh, the IgM is not completely ionized, the Lyman alpha photon, once they've escaped their galaxies, so they escape the ISM and the, the signal active medium, they can be further suppressed by the neutral hydrogen gas in the IGF. So suppose we have our galaxy, which has Lyman alpha escaping for it, but that and residing in an ionized region of the universe, then its Lyman alpha will be freely uh, transmitted to us and we will observe it in emission. The same galaxy, if it's placed in a, a region uh, where the IgM is, is mostly neutral, at least partially neutral, if, even if the Lyman alpha escape from, from the ISM and the signal of the galactic medium, it will then be suppressed by, by the neutral hydrogen in the IgM. So we will not see Lyman alpha. So basically, the Lyman alpha visibility, once we enter the epoch of ionization, so the epoch when the IgM is not anymore completely uh, ionized, but is partially neutral, we, various degrees of neutrality. The Lyman alpha visibility, but also the profile itself of the Lyman alpha line, and also the clustering of the galaxy emitting uh, uh, Lyman alpha, all will depend on the amount and also on the distribution of the neutral hydrogen in the intervening IgM. So this is a, a picture by, again, Masami, Yuri Masami showing exactly this. So the galaxies residing in large bubbles will come to us, 
and the other, the galaxies in the ionized, uh, in the still neutral region, will have their Lyman alpha completely suppressed. Uh, the effects of the neutral hydrogen content on the Lyman alpha visibility can be measured basically with two techniques, and we've do, been doing this now for many years. So one way is to measure the fraction of the star-forming galaxies that have a, a Lyman alpha in emission above some threshold that we can decide what it is. And in this case, the rap, so we know that uh, the fraction rises up, and this is due to galaxy evolution. And then at a certain point, we expect that there, there would be a rapid fall of Lyman alpha emission. And this would indicate reionization. So this, this uh, rise up is due to galaxy evolution, but then we have uh, the IGM, the neutral IGM, the neutral fraction of the IGM coming up as an effect in the Lyman alpha fraction. And then we have this abrupt decrease at a certain point. And this point would mean that there is the start to be neutral hydrogen in the IGM. Another way is to uh, look at the differential evolution of the Lyman alpha luminosity function compared to the UV luminosity function. Again, here we have, for example, the luminosity density of galaxies in the UV, which we know declines with redshift because it depends, of course, on galaxy evolution. Uh, if you look at the Lyman alpha photons and we compute the luminosity density of the Lyman alpha photons, it will also, of course, depend on galaxy evolution. We know that as we go to higher redshift, the galaxies, they, they, there are less galaxies in the fainter. But at a certain point, it will kind of decouple from the UV density because on top of this, we will have the effect of the IgM neutral fraction, which does not affect the UV photons, but only affects the Lyman alpha photons. So these two techniques are basically largely complementary. The Lyman alpha luminosity, of course, is also uh, can be um, uh, addressed with uh, photometric data, so multi-wavelength observations, where, of course, the Lyman alpha fraction uh, that I showed earlier can only be uh, in, uh, evaluated by looking at the spectro uh, doing spectroscopy of, of galaxies. But the two techniques basically are, are largely complementary. Um, and in this case, of course, the, the redshift one between the couples indicate realization. So when exactly does Lyman alpha decline? So uh, about 10 years ago, many groups indicated uh, had um, made some observations and uh, the, the earlier results indicated that the fraction is rising up to redshift six and then it was declining. So this epoch beyond redshift six uh, seemed to be the epoch when the IGM started to become partially neutral. So basically, you know, redshift six is more or less when a uh, realization was completed and then above that, the, the hydrogen, neutral hydrogen fraction was uh, uh, becoming larger. Uh, but the earlier results were, were quite uncertain both for observational limits, because our samples were kind of small and heterogeneous, but also because soon we started to realize that there were large field-to-field -field variations, which were probably due to the fact that the ionization is a patchy um, transition. So it does not happen at the same time in no uh, line of sight. So uh, if we are observing in, in one particular field, we might find higher uh, Lyman alpha transmission, and in another field, there will be lower uh, transmission. This is also, of course, predicted by, by these models. So the last years, I've seen a number of systematic surveys to search for Lyman alpha and doing this in large samples of galaxies, so really systematic searches. And I mentioned here some of the projects I've been involved, but there's been really many in, uh, in, um, going on at uh, the largest telescope. So this was a follow-up of uh, almost 200 galaxies we did at the, uh, with a large VLT spectroscopic survey of, of the Candles galaxies uh, in the HST Candles fields. And we confirmed several 10 new galaxies at, uh, at the high redshift, mostly with Lyman alpha. You see here, these are the spectra we obtained. They're extremely faint. So these galaxies are very distant and their Lyman alpha emission is of course hard to, to observe, uh, both because uh, some of it is suppressed by the neutral hydrogen, but also because it's intrinsically, intrinsically faint. Another effort uh, was applied by Steve Pintas, and I'll show some results here. This was done with Peck, Demos, and Mosfire, and thanks to Mosfire, we could extend the search up to Redshift 8. And here are some new solid detections of galaxies between Redshift 7 and 8, all showing nine and alpha. Here is an example of one of these galaxies. And uh, again, you see how faint they are. the galaxies are. These are the, the HST images. Of course, the galaxy only appear in the, in the near infrared as very tiny little dots here. And then we take the spectrum and we see the Lyman alpha in emission with its characteristic asymmetric shape. So we can ensure that this is a galaxy, in this case at Reggie 7.599. So really one of the most distant one known. A complementary effort, which is very important, was applied by Marusha Dadat. And in this case, we 
uh, with splunctive the manipulation power of lensing cluster. So instead of going and observing field galaxies at the uh, redshift uh, that we thought was seven or eight, we exploited the magnification of, of, uh, uh, of clusters and, and uh, selected uh, candidate uh, emitters behind uh, these, uh, these magnifying clusters. And so in this way, we could reach unmagnified uh, magnitudes that are very faint. So here you see the uh, UV magnitude, intrinsic UV magnitude of down to minus 15. This is only possible because we have a magnification of the clusters that are in between. And so we can study much uh, fainter intrinsic, uh, intrinsic galaxies. And again, here you see we observed uh, many uh, couple of hundred galaxies uh, with uh, many of them, of course, uh, uh, and unknown detection, so in many of them we don't see Lyman alpha, and then we have uh, many detections with, with Lyman alpha. This is an example of, of one such galaxy. Uh, this is also uh, a, this is a magnified galaxy, it's also as a shield. And I will not mention the other, the many other surveys that have been carried out in the last years. These are really very recent results, but I want to emphasize that all these programs that involve large investment of times, so many hundreds of hours on the biggest cells. So we are really pushing the present facilities to, to the, the, um, the, their best capabilities. And I don't think it can be anything, we cannot do anything better with, with what we have at present. Uh, just to show how hard are these observations and how, uh, how big is the effect of the neutral hydrogen in suppressing the lemon alpha, this is a galaxy at Redshift 7. It's a very normal galaxy, but it's one of the most uh, solid Redshift 7 candidates that we, uh, that we had since, I think, for 15 years. So it was selected from ultra-deep HST imaging, and it's kind of the perfect candidate Redshift 7 galaxy. It, uh, it appears in uh, the luminosity functions of Redshift 7 by basically everybody who has played with this data. So several groups have gone and tried to uh, actually detect uh, uh, its Lyman alpha to confirm that it's at Redshift 7. And we went to the archive and we see that there were 52 hours of course to uh, uh, observations obtained by three independent groups. So we combined all this data, so we obtained a 52 hours VLT spectrum of the source and still we don't see any Lyman alpha. So Lyman alpha is really suppressed down to a flux limit that is really, really incredibly faint. Um, now, once we have all these uh, results, so we have uh, determined the visibility of Lyman alpha, and this is one of the latest uh, uh, So this, uh, this plot here is from Kuller et al, and it, it comprises most of the, uh, the, the most recent renditions of this uh, Lyman alpha meter fraction. You see that there is still a lot of scatter between data, and uh, also we, we still uh, really don't know if, for example, bright and faint sources behave at the same, at the same way. We think probably they don't behave in the same way, but we still uh, are very limited by, by, by uh, the scatter of the data. In any case, once we have these results, and, and most of them show a rapid, this rapid fall after a, a basically a redshift 7, it's a, it's a very rapid uh, drop in the Lyman alpha fraction. So at redshift 7 to 8, we really need to observe many galaxies to find Lyman alpha. But once we have this, we have to convert these observational results into a constraint on the IgM neutral hydrogen fraction, which is what is of interest for us to constrain the ionization timeline. And this is a really non-trivial exercise because it requires extensive modeling of the physics from the parsec to the gigaparsec scale. And the reason is that we have to model how the Lyman alpha escapes from, from the galaxies. And this, of course, requires knowing the, the, the uh, the, uh, the physics of parsec scale or, or, or on small scales. And then we have to model how uh, the neutral hydrogen in the IgM would depress this uh, lemon alpha that is emitted from the galaxy. So basically what we observe is this, uh, this is the probability distribution of Lyman alpha and this is what you observe, but we have to have a knowledge on the intrinsic Lyman alpha from the galaxy and then on this uh, transmission function. And what is normally done is by many different people is that uh, we rely on large scale cosmological simulations, which are used to produce maps of cosmic uh, ionized uh, hydrogen or, or neutral hydrogen. And then uh, we do, uh, these are large scale, so up to gigaparsecs, and then we do hydrodynamic simulations on smaller scale, because of course they need to be more resolved. We have to need to be able to resolve the, um, in the, in the uh, ionized patches of IgM, we need to be able to resolve the self-shielding gas clumps, which uh, of course will still be in these ionized patches. 
And once we do this, we have to uh, 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 we have to process the, the, the simulations and, and uh, do the uh, transport of light emission of transport of light and alpha photos in the ISM and the CGM of, of the galaxies. And finally, we have to do radiating transfer to the IGM to understand how the Lyman alpha will arrive at the observers. So what uh, the models give us out, for example, is uh, the redshift evolution of the Lyman alpha luminosity function. Here's an example, very recent example. And we have the intrinsic luminosity function. And then we, the models tell us how it's suppressed after it passes through the CGM and also after the, it passes through the IGM. For example, you see here the, the violet line. This is the intrinsic Lyman alpha. And then in the presence of a very high neutral hydrogen, it is very much depressed, suppressed after uh, it passes through the IGM. Okay. And another, another model output is, is, for example, is in this form. So we have the equivalent distribution of Lyman alpha emission in galaxies. This is the intrinsic one, the black line. And then with various degrees of neutral hydrogen, we see, you see from the models how this distribution uh, is, uh, is uh, suppressed. So for example, for a very high uh, neutral hydrogen, 0.87, you would see that uh, there are no more uh, emitters with, uh, with bright uh, equivalent width. So these, these ones are completely suppressed. Um, so uh, let me skip this. So what is the, the, the how, how are the results currently, um, uh, what are the, the results telling us at the moment? So these are, this is a very recent uh, uh, compendium of all the results from uh, from Ur et al. And they, they are the different probes that we're using. What I've talked so far was the Lyman alpha equivalent distribution and the Lyman alpha luminosity functions. And you see here, these are the constraints we get on the neutral hydrogen fraction at the various redshifts. You see that uh, the uh, error bars, uh, the, the, the allowed uh, parameter space is still very much, uh, very large, for example, uh, for a redshift from 7 to 7.5, the Lyman alpha uh, fraction tell us that the new hydrogen content has to be something between 0.4, 40% and 70%. Whereas, for example, the Lyman alpha luminosity function gives us uh, 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 constraints that are, are, are lower, so uh, lower values of uh, the uh, new hydrogen fraction. So what you see from here is that uh, results are, are still still have large uncertainties. And in some cases, they also a bit at odd with each other. For example, the luminosity functions result are more in agreement with these uh, um, very gradual realization scenarios where the neutral hydrogen fraction changes very, uh, let's say, smoothly and not very rapidly. So this scenario here. Whereas these other uh, probes, the Lyman alpha fraction, are more in agreement with this scenario that is also favored by, by the plan data, which is a late and rapid realization scenario. This is the, uh, these are the dotted, uh, uh, this is the dotted line. So you see that uncertainties are still very large and we cannot really constrain very well the scenario. So we need, uh, unfortunately, more, more data despite the fact that we've done all this uh, work on it. So very briefly, what about the topology of organization? Can we say something about uh, this with the with present data? So uh, very, uh, in, in a very sketchy picture, what is, uh, what can we say about the topology of radiation? So the, this is our intrinsic Lyman alpha uh, luminosity distribution. If our ionization process is very uh, smooth, so it's, there will be a homogeneous dimming of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the sources. So all regions will have more or less the same transmission and we will see the same, more or less the same number of sources, but uh, they will be fainter. On the other hand, if we have very patchy ionization, some regions will have a much higher transmission, and so we will see Lyman alpha from these regions. And in other regions, we will have a, a very high neutral hydrogen fraction, and so there will be no transmission of Lyman alpha. So the uh, distribution will be completely changed. What we can do for the moment is uh, look at the evidence for the dispersed uh, regions of uh, uh, enhanced Lyman alpha visibility, which we call rayonized bubbles. And this is one example that we found already a few years ago. These are three emitters in uh, very close to each other. Two of them are actually only at 90 kiloparsecs of physical separation, and they're really at the same redshift. All of them show very bright Lyman alpha. And uh, each galaxy, what we can, we can do is see if each galaxy could carve its own ionized bubble. This is the, the formula we use, and uh, the ionized bubble will uh, depend on, uh, of course, the lifetime of the source and the number of ionizing photons that are produced and also those that can escape the IGM. And uh, this bubble has to be larger than one megaparsec to allow the Lyman alpha photons to, to reach us. Uh, 
uh, what we, we see in this case is that the three emitters alone cannot carve large enough bubbles to, to see Lyman Alpha, but actually there are other fainter galaxies in, in the region around them, so they sit in a novel density, and these uh, companion galaxies, there are about 10 companion galaxies of which we still don't have the redshift, but they seem to be at the same distance, and they could contribute to the uh, formation of this ionized bubble. And actually very recently, there were more examples of these uh, uh, bubbles that are forming uh, with clustering of, of, uh, of a few emitters. For example, this is uh, a, another triplet of emitters. And in which case, uh, this is a Reci 7.7. .7. This is a Reci where we expect really to have a almost very, very high uh, neutral hydrogen fraction in the, in, in the IGM. So we don't expect to see many lamina emitters, but this, in this particular region, there are three of them. One of them is bright enough to carve a big bubble of ionization around it, and the other two, they are visible because they probably sit in the same bubble. So basically, there is a region that is carved by the bright galaxy, and then the other galaxies are visible because they sit in this particular region. And even more recently, there was another uh, very big uh, um, discovery of a, a region with 16 uh, emitters, all of the same redshift. This is a kind of uh, the biggest uh, over density that has been identified. And uh, these are uh, much larger regions, but uh, in so several tens of, of uh, megaparsec. But in this case, uh, you see many of these uh, uh, galaxies that really uh, are sitting in common bubbles. Of course, the real progress about the, pro the topology of realization will only come from spatial distribution of Lyman alpha emitters on much larger scale. So really to understand the topology of, of this transition, we will need to map these Lyman alpha emitters on, on scales of, of degrees. And uh, there is already one such program, and this is a silver rush program on the hyper supreme thumb, which has uh, uh, actually, as, as it's saying, is uh, the mapping of the distribution of the Lyman alpha emitters on, on scale of degrees. Uh, hyper supreme thumb is, is, uh, is only an optical uh, camera, so we can only probe these up to reg 7 but as I will show, in, in a minute, there are more uh, uh, instruments that will do this uh, in, uh, in uh, can do this in the near infrared, so can, they can push this uh, mapping on the large scale of Lyman alpha down up, up to redshift, uh, up to higher redshift, so redshift uh, seven and eight and above. Uh, of course, why it is important also to map uh, the Lyman alpha meters because uh, uh, in the future we will have also SKA and synergies. Uh, between SKA and the distribution of Lyman alpha emitters will really provide constraints on, on how ionization happens. This is our, uh, these are simulations from a paper by Kubot et al, but there are really many papers, many people working on, on this, on providing us these uh, um, uh, predictions from the, from the constraint that we can get from the cross correlation of the 21 centimeter signal. So here is really in, in the 21 centimeter signal, we really, really see which are the patches of ionized, where the universe is ionized, the IGM is ionized, and which are the places where the universe is still neutral. And, uh, and then we can cross-correlate this with the Lyman alpha distribution map. So in this case, for example, if you have a, a, a patch, this is, I think it's a redshift 6.6 .6, uh, simulation, so uh, the universe is largely uh, ionized already, but there are still patches of, of neutral hydrogen, areas of neutral, neutral hydrogen. And then here you will see that uh, you will, should get voids, so no Lyman alpha emitters in these areas where the universe is still large emitter. Uh, so as I said, um, unfortunately at the moment we really pushed our facilities to, um, to uh, the limits. And so clearly to make uh, significant progress in our understanding of realization, we really, really need the new facilities, but fortunately, I mean, JWC is, is coming in a few months, by the end of the year should be launched. And JWC will really open an entire new parameter space because we will be able to routinely observe, observe extremely light, uh, faint line and alpha, coupled also with other lines. So in this case, we, if you, we see other emission lines in the like uh, C3 or, or optical lines, which we will be able to observe in near spec, uh, we will really uh, be able to understand how many of these sources have or don't have line and alpha and, and really assess the user hydrogen fraction in a much better way. This is a simulated near spec spectrum of Regit 8.9 galaxy in the ERS program Cheers led by Steve Finkelstein. But there's been also many uh, um, geo programs observed that have the uh, approved that have the aim to uh, really observe that the the most distant universe and the early delivered sources. So I think with JWST, we will really make a lot of progress. But I also want to mention 
uh, the, the two upcoming optical uh, near infrared spectrograph uh, um, that will be available in BMT and, and, and Subaru, so moons, like BMT and PFS with Subaru, because they will be largely complementary to near spec in the sense they will have a very large field of view. And so they will allow us to really uh, study the large scale distribution of Lyman alpha emitters up to very high redshift. And these, of course, as uh, coupled to the SKA uh, observations that uh, I led eventually, and with the cross correlation that I showed in the slide before, will be able to tell us a lot about the realization. And of course, we still don't know uh, the culprit. So did, uh, there is the last question that we want to ask answer is, uh, did galaxies ionize the universe? So once we know how realization happened, what was the timeline and what was the spatial distribution of a spatial process of realization, we also need to answer to this other question, did galaxy ionize the universe? And, uh, but for this, I would talk, uh, uh, for this, I would require another talk. So I, I think I, I just uh, uh, showed this slide saying that these are the parameters we need to observe. And unfortunately, for at least for some of them, we still really don't have any, uh, many constraints on this. So uh, this is my last slide, and I hope I, I show you that despite the hard efforts of many groups, uh, the end of realization is a still largely enigmatic period, but still very fascinating, and we need really to, to uh, study more to understand it. And uh, although uh, I, I could not provide uh, solid results, I hope I show that uh, we have developed uh, sophisticated models and also solid observational techniques. So we have already laid the, the foundations for a rapid progress. So, once the upcoming new facilities will start to work, I think we will really make, uh, uh, thanks to this uh, foundation, we, uh, our, our progress will be really fast. And uh, I'll stop here and take some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, questions, we have plenty of time for them. Yeah, Laura, thanks very much, of course, for this uh, exciting talk. I uh, am, of course, also looking for questions from uh, the audience. Uh, perhaps uh, if you haven't done so, please uh, provide them. The question I had, Laura, following your talk was, although you already addressed uh, some of this uh, uh, in your talk at the end, of course, for future facilities, I was specifically interested, of course, in what the ELT could bring uh, to your research uh, the coming decade. Okay, so I haven't put the ELT because it's uh, it's a... Uh... Of course, uh, even further in time, uh, moons and PFS, and of course, GWST will, uh, will really come in the next, uh, hopefully, couple of years. And uh, of course, the ELT, uh, for, it would be extremely important to have uh, a, like a multi-object spectrograph mounted on the, the ELT, like a mosaic, for example. I mean, the other uh, giant telescopes uh, will have uh, their actually among the first light instrument, multi-object spectrograph. And uh, so this shows that uh, multi-object spectra are really prime facilities for, for many different uh, scientific issues, but uh, specifically also for, for the, high, the study of the high redshift universe. So I think it would be extremely important to, uh, to have a mosaic uh, eventually on the, on the UT. Yeah, thank you. So if I'm not mistaken, unless one of my colleague panelists sees uh, questions. I, I didn't see actually uh, a question in the Q&A session or in the Slack, but they can still come. And so what I propose, Laura, is uh, to thank you, of course, uh, for your great presentation. And I will give back the floor to Agatha. Yes, and, uh, actually, uh, I also have one question. So, uh, but this is a kind of summarizing question. So. Uh, do when do you expect exactly overviewing all those instruments to see uh, the LAE uh, from Redshift 10? Uh, I mean, even with the first observations of, of JWST, I think uh, it will be a possible, right? Yes. yes. Or at least confirm with other, maybe not Lyman Alpha, but other lines. And then we, we, if, uh, I mean, uh, if there is really, I mean, at, at Redshift 10, we really expect the IDM to be almost completely neutral. So uh, maybe mm -hmm. it be more uh, possible to confirm this galaxy with other lines. And, and then from, from, the, from the other lines, we can confirm the Redshift. And then by knowing that there is no Lyman alpha, we can estimate how much neutral IDM has suppressed this Lyman alpha. So, and there is one comment.
Um, Do you want me to read it for, out? Yes, if you can, please. Yeah, that is a comment by Eros van Zella. I think the ionizing photon production efficiency will be okay very soon, thanks to JWST at uh, Redshift Lawson and 6.5 regarding escape fraction of ionizing radiation from galaxies. Do you think we can make some progress soon? Uh, that's a good question, Eros. Uh, I think uh, you're right. So, uh, so of the three parameters, the escape fraction will, will stay elusive. I mean, we have uh, already with HST, uh, I, mean, I mean, there has been uh, quite a few programs uh, carried out in the past uh, few years, uh, especially with these UV dedicated programs. And I think we still need to see the results out of these programs. So I'm sure that there will be uh, new exciting results soon. Uh, but uh, yes, this will remain possibly for the next few years still the most uh, uncertain parameter. So we will have, I think we will make progress with this, with the, with the results that are, are arriving from, from the latest HST large programs but uh, it will remain uh, still uncertain for more time. Yeah, I, I hear the applause of 585 participants. So thanks uh, very much, so Agatha, it's back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Thank you all speakers for exciting talks. And now we start really closing ceremony. I would like to invite the president of IAS for the concluding remarks of all annual meeting. Roger Davies, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Agata. Uh, what a session this has been, uh, from Mars to Nobel Prize winning observations brought about by fantastically innovative instrumentation to the epoch of reionization and all wrapped up nicely by Javier showing us how ESO will help retain our European position at the forefront of astronomical research. It's been a week full of exciting sessions and scientific interaction, and I'd like to thank each and every one of the participants for your contributions. This is what it's all about. It's been a huge meeting, over 2,500 registrations, over 1,400 of which were students from 63 countries, over a thousand talks and a thousand posters. We've had some splendid sessions thanks to the efforts of the individual session chairs and their organizing committees. I learned myself a lot from the Galaxy Evolution sessions and I'm sure each of you will have your own individual highlights. It takes a huge effort to organize such an event. I mentioned in my opening remarks, the immense amount of work done by the scientific organizing committee and the local organizers in Leiden, who took on this responsibility for the second time way above what any reasonable person could expect them to do. It's a huge amount of work. I also want to thank the staff from the Kuoni Congress who've supported the meeting so effectively. But this afternoon, I particularly want to highlight the contribution of our 56 volunteers and their amazing coordinator, Alexandra Shouten. Without them and their ability to react quickly and effectively in all kinds of circumstances, the whole meeting would not have been possible and certainly would not have run so smoothly. Finally, for the thank yous, I want to thank my fellow council members for all the work they do for your society throughout the year. And of course, our home team in Geneva, led by our outstanding executive secretary, Mark O'Dar. Thank you to all of you. Much has happened this week. Yesterday saw the start of SKA phase one construction. Congratulations to Phil Diamond and all his team for reaching this milestone. Again, thunderous applause. We also heard from Samaya Nisenki of the first convincing detection of gravitational waves from not one, but two black hole neutron star binaries. I'm sure we want to congratulate her and the whole LIGO Virgo CAGRA team on this fantastic result. We end the week with some chastening news of the computer malfunction on what must be astronomy's highest profile instrument, the ESA NASA Hubble Space Telescope. We know that the engineers are working hard on finding a solution and we wish them every success and hope for good news. 
At the same time, we look forward excitingly to the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope on ESA's Ariane 5 rocket later this year. It's been a strange year. The impact of coronavirus on everybody has been significant. And the latent appetite for scientific interaction has been amply demonstrated by the eagerness to participate in this meeting. We all look forward to meeting face to face in Valencia next year. These annual meetings remind us of our common purpose of exploring the universe and sharing the wonder we experience with the wider public. As wonderfully uh, done this week by Martin Rees in his talk yesterday evening. By bringing astronomers together from across Europe and indeed the world, these meetings build a community, community cohesion and remind us that we can achieve far more together than we can in our separate institutes and nations. I wish you stay safe until our meeting next year and look forward to meeting you again in Valencia. I will hand over now to our Vice President, Lex Kappa, who is also the Chair of the Annual Meeting Board. Lex. Thank you, Roger. And uh, I, of course, support you very much in your conclusion that this has been an amazing task that uh, has been achieved by the Leiden team and, of course, supported by uh, the Kuwoni conference team and ours, our team at the IWAS uh, board. So although you only would see me if uh, in this particular setup, I think I should ask uh, Huub and Joop sequentially to just say a few words so that at least the public uh, will see them and also can thank them for all their great work. So Huub, perhaps you could say something on behalf of the Leiden Observatory and Joop on behalf of the SOC. And then, of course, I want to transfer at some point to Valencia, where Jose Carlos Girado will lead uh, the hosting team over there. So, Huub. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lex. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short because on Monday I had the privilege of introducing uh, uh, Leiden and the whole landscape in, in Holland in terms of astronomy. So, uh, uh, over a few of what you just said, I think we've in Europe we've done an amazing amount of work and collaborations really at the uh, at the forefront there. If you combine ESO, ESA, and SKA, and the amount of science that came out of it, it's amazing. I think we should also not forget the ESC that supported us. So I'm very very happy with this meeting. I'm also very happy that uh, uh, we're not going to do this a third time because it's. <laughs> uh, but we, um, I think the organization went very smooth. Also thanks to the AS board. So thanks all of you there. And I think that I would like to uh, wish Valencia uh, all the best. And that's uh, this next. So Jose Carlos, uh, uh, good luck. Yeah, we, we will need some advice from you shortly. So Jo, perhaps I could uh, introduce you briefly again as the chair of the SOC of what I think has been become the biggest uh, astronomical meeting online in astronomy in Europe. And uh, so please, uh, the floor is yours for now. Thank you. Yeah, I want to take this opportunity to thank the other members of the scientific organizing committee. Um, first of all, my co-chair Connie Arts and the other people that helped with the organ scientific organization were Nabila Aganin, Jarle Breitman, Paula Caselli, Ineke de Mortel, Heino Falke, Johan Finbo, Eva Gabel, Tristan Guillot, Lex Kaper, Carmela Lardo, Sarah Lucatello, Harald Mellema, Rafaela Morganti, Heike Rauer, Nanda Rea, Huub Rutgering, Agata Rosanska, Robert Sabo, Alberto Vecchio, and Norbert Werner. I also would like to thank all the scientific organizers and committees of the individual sessions who did a huge amount of work, of course, and for the, for the science we need participants. And I've been very pleased to see how interactive all the different sessions have been. And uh, that's only thanks to the, to the great effort that everyone who's listening now and not listening has put in. So thanks to everyone. So thanks again, Joop, for the marvelous work. And of course, uh, with you also all the other people involved in the scientific organization of this uh, enormously broad and interesting meeting. Now we will have a flag 
uh, that we could pass over to Jose Carlos, who will lead uh, the uh, organizing team in Valencia. And so the whole idea, of course, is that uh, we will go back to normal at some point, and we hope, of course, in uh, uh, 2022, uh, the last week of June, that in Valencia we can meet again in person. We will take with us, of course, many things we have learned over the past years. But please, Jose, could you already bring us for a few moments to Valencia and to the south of Europe, where we hopefully will meet uh, in a year from now? Yes, actually, thank, thank you, Alex. Uh, actually, I, I prepared some images. If I can share the screen, uh, it should be like this. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes, the, the University of Valencia, the, the Astronomical Observatory of the University of Valencia will be the, the it's honor to host the next year's uh, 2022 meeting uh, in Valencia in, in Spain. Uh, the conference will take place in the dates you are seeing uh, from June 27th, from July 1st. I would like you to, to type or to write down these dates in your calendar or in your, the platform you are using or your agenda. Um, so keep this in mind. Uh, we still have a, an entire year to go, but um, the hosting committee has started to to, to do some some works in, in collaboration with the, with Kuoni and the, with uh, with the IAS. And I can tell you what we have from from for, for now. The meeting will be held in Valencia, in the, on the shores of the Mediterranean of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, we already know about the, the the venue. The venue will be the the conference center, the new almost new conference center in, in Valencia, which is a particular, I would say, extraordinary uh, architecture. It's had the resemblance of a boat or some, something like this. Uh, um, I never I have to say that I never dreamed to, to uh, organize an astronomical meeting in such an extraordinary building, but we had now the opportunity to put all these uh, nice spaces to, for the sake of astronomy, which is, uh, I would say, remarkable. Um, the hosting committee is uh, committed to um, to have events spread all over the city, so you can see, you can see or enjoy other uh, iconic uh, iconic building of the city. For instance, the uh, City of Art or Sciences is a, a complex, a four building complex dedicated to to culture and to uh, uh, to science. Uh, it's composed by an opera house, a planetarium, science museum. And we hope to, uh, we expect to organize uh, some events inside or outside the, these, these, these buildings. Uh, Valencia combines this modern architecture also with some uh, ancient buildings and some historic uh, places, like in the old town is plenty of this, of this building. Uh, just to show one of them is the, the cathedral, which is uh, just a walking distance for the university dorms or the planned university dorms. Um, another place is that um, well, Valencia is um, is crossed by a riverbed. It's uh, this green line you see in the middle. Um, there, there is no water; you can walk over this, and this connected the center with the with the, with the beach. Um, well, it's summertime. Uh, uh, well, we expect you to somehow uh, enjoy the weather and enjoy some other uh, typical items from our land. Um, back to the city center. Um, let me go a bit, little bit more formal. Um, we have the uh, the central offices of the University of Valencia, and there is uh, the old observatory is uh, is in there. Um, it uh, was founded at the beginning of the past century. Uh, we still have a, a group telescope that is still still work. I have to say, and Valencia has a long tradition in astronomy, and um, well. Uh, both in the observatory and in the astronomy department of the university, more than uh, 30 astronomers are working in, in projects covering a large number of fields. Uh, so on behalf of the council of the university, on behalf of the society, on behalf of the host committee, uh, we cordially invite you to, to the next year's meeting in Valencia. Your presence uh, at this conference is, is needed, is highly appreciated. Um, to finish, um, our friends at the convention center told me that to show a little video, it's 90 seconds. They, they, they will kill me if I don't show you this. So it's just 90 seconds, okay, video, uh, just summarizing how, how is life in Valencia. I hope this works or something. Okay.
So stay tuned. Call for science session is uh, will happen very soon. Thank you.